And I'll turn it over to Rob. Thank you. Go Good. On, give Good. it a round of applause. You got me? Yeah. Yeah. My first meetup. And maybe my last. I'm not sure. We'll see. I, I was expecting those seats over there to be full, but we'll. It's uh, summer. We, it's, it's, that's the, that, is that the excuse we're going to yeah. use? All right, summer. Well, I'm a very competitive guy. So when I see empty seats, I, I came ready to roll anyhow. I see empty seats, now I'm going for double green card. I want it real good. I want you to tell people uh, you shouldn't have taken off that week and gone to, to Rehoboth or wherever you think you went to. So in any case, um, nice to be here. I've got an hour, is that correct? Yeah, I'm going to call it an hour. It won't feel like an hour, don't worry. So if you like, <laughs> not, not to worry. A matter of fact, at one point, near the end, I know they're giving out two books on a raffle. I'm giving one out. Uh, but I'm going to give you an opportunity, just 10 of you, and you'll decide which 10 you are, to come up and see who's the most mentally agile here. <laughs> and, and because what we're going to talk about requires mental agility. really does. Uh, you know, I, I'm a process guy. Real, you, you got the fact that, yep, 30 years as a professional speaker, and I write books and, and, and go around the world and, and talk. But I actually am a University of Maryland alum, came out of University of Maryland. Within two weeks, I was selling to the, the New York Life Insurance Company. Life, health, and disability. Any former life insurance salespeople in here who care to admit it? <laughs> Uh, you know what? I, I, I think it's a fine profession, by the way. But if I ruled, if I was the czar of the insurance rule world, all I'd do is say, not till we get to about 25. And it's not that we're not mentally able to do it. It's that uh, one of the reasons why you don't like the word sales. And we built that book. This one, I've got a couple of sales books out. But we put a cat and a mouse, no dollar signs. We really toned it down. It's because... The rest of the world that doesn't actively sell is irritated when they hear the word selling. I don't sell, I don't Well, are you sure? You sure you want to just turn your back on that skill set? Because I think what you're saying is, I don't want to sell the way I've seen it done poorly when I went to buy a car or when I went to get them. I don't want to knock some of my brothers and sisters out there, but maybe the mattress floor is a little rough too if you've ever been in there. There's some real bad experiences, but you know, done right, I needed to write a book and talk to a, a, a group of people and an audience that realizes that if we could find a way to talk about persuasion and influence in an ethical manner and figure out where that line is, are you sure you want to tell me that, that it's not a skill set that you'll need? You know, you, you, we, we've got an agile room here. When I was a young pup, uh, I worked for Xerox for about a decade right at the training center, Xerox Document University, if you've ever been, it's no longer, but if you ever went down Route 7 on the way to Leesburg, some of you are nodding, and it became Lansdowne Resort, and it became, I can't even go in there because it, of what it became, but when I worked there, it was 2,300 acres of just beautiful land and 300 head of deer and things like that, but I, I worked for a company after New York Life, and by the way, I. I sold a lot of insurance. Uh, I didn't leave the New York Life Insurance Company because I didn't sell. It took me 11 years after I left to exceed the income I made when I was 22. I left because I had an ethical issue with it. Not that insurance is a bad product, but for a 22-year-old who's single, <coughs> without a home, without a wife or children, that need thing is missing. And that's when the ethics get stretched a little bit. But Xerox. Fine company. New York Life taught me to love selling. Uh, Xerox taught me how. You, you didn't tie a shoe at Xerox without some sort of process. But you know, when they said when you got a process, you have a way of measuring what you're doing. And when you can measure it, you can fix it. And that's so we have to. We're going to make this a little more scientific in here. Don't you know? I I hope that you're entertained and inspired and motivated. Uh, but I really want to lay out a process for you that you can apply to those who may doubt what you're doing, those who struggle. When I say I was a young pup, I, I taught the Leadership Through Quality program at Xerox in the, uh, in the 80s uh, and uh, early 90s. And that was a big deal. That was problem solving. That was quality improvement. And that was frowned upon by most people who said, it's taking too long. 
We just want to go ahead and do the project. Why are we going through these processes? But you know why we go through processes. Because ultimately we move faster and more efficiently when we do. It's just sometimes that may need to be sold a little bit. And so that's why I think the topic will be real good for you today. And, uh, but we'll start with a, a poll. And the poll is this. Now that we've used the S word and said selling, how do you define, how, how do you define selling? And think about it. If I, I'm going to give you four definitions. And I just want you to pick the one that, that's closest to you, what you would define it as. Uh, oh, handout coming, but it's not even in the handout. Uh, I hope this, you'll appreciate this, and thanks for making the copies, by the way, but I, I am, um, I'm a trainer at heart. So when I say I hope you're inspired and motivated, that's good stuff, and I hope you are. But I want to inform you, which means I'm not handing you a picture of slides when we're done. I'm gonna, I've already got the text under each slide of what I want you to get from every slide that goes up. Well, most every, because this one's not even in the handout. I just want a level set. So handout coming, hang tight, let's level set. Define selling. So here's your four choices. You've got to pick one. No write-ins. You can't pick two. Behave yourselves. All right, so here are your four choices. Maybe selling in your mind is or should be defined as doing what you say you're going to do, making a commitment with the client and sticking with that commitment. Maybe it's listening, actually listening to the person across the way and taking their needs, assessing their needs, and then providing solutions to those needs. Maybe it's persuading customers or clients to fix or address existing problems or concerns, bless you. Or maybe it's your ability to link the specific need of that client or customer to the benefits of your idea or your solution. Now, I'm not calling a 60 in here, but for the television audience at home, we're going to call it 50, just for the heck of it. All right, it's, it's, it's a wide 50. Okay, so how many of you with your one and only vote would say, I'll go right at the top. I think selling really is the act of doing what you say you're going to do. Let the record show that not one hand is going up in this room. <laughs> We're an ethical lot. That's a good thing. Actually, that may very well define ethics, but you're good. I'm asking you to define what selling is. So how about the second one? Listening to the person that you're dealing, that you're communicating with. Taking the needs of that person and providing solutions, okay? And we've got just a smattering. We're going to call this 10, okay? I got it. Locked in. How about persuading customers to fix or address existing problems or concerns? And let the record state that one guy who's by himself has put his hand up in this room. <laughs> Sheepishly, but he's sticking with that. And the record will also show that the rest of the room, 40-ish, we're saying, uh, is, is coming down with linking the specific needs of that client to the benefits of your idea or your solution. Good, let's lock that in. Get to that in a moment. But let's turn it around. How many of you in this room have ever actually gone through a formalized sales training program before? I know you just went through one this week or last week. Okay, this half is the sales half, apparently. Okay, almost every hand went up over there. Good, okay. Uh, now I work with Toyota and I work with uh, uh, over 50 financial institutions. Uh, GE. I work with some, some major companies, so I'm used to working with some of their big hitting salespeople. When I ask that question, it frequently irritates them. So let me irritate you. How many uh, of the people who put up their hand? How many of you have gone through more than one of them? And it's let the record stay. That, that same group over there is putting their hand up. Yeah, not only do we do it, we do it a lot. Uh, and I'm not so sure that's a good thing either. We'll talk about that perhaps. But with all that study, have you ever sort of flipped the script and said, what if we don't study how to sell? What if we study how people buy? Do you believe that people go through repeatable, predictable steps when they make a decision? Excellent. Decision for change. Well, um, I'm a student of many of the sales training programs, and some of them are really good. But that's where I'd always want to start. If you don't believe that, let me prove it to you today. And if you do, hang tight. But let's just... Suspend our disbelief for a moment. If I could prove it to you, if I could prove to you that this gentleman goes through six different stages, three critical decision points, 
Why in the world would we not start there? Why wouldn't you, for the rest of your career, before you approach a tactic, say, well, I mean, this isn't a script, this isn't a straitjacket. Where's the person I'm talking to? Let me line up with that person. That's what we're going to do in here. I'm going to show you a decision cycle that people go through. I'm going to show you where their decision points are. I'll show you where they get stuck. It'll look familiar. And I want to put one tactic on the table to move them. But, but now that we have the definition of selling up, let's flip it. Let's get the definition of buying up in a sense. Think about a major ticket item in your life. For many of you, we can call it, uh, let, let's, let's say your home uh, or your apartment or wherever you're living, the basement, not sure, whatever it is. Uh, not making any eye contact. You'll notice that the, the Jollis' head is just sort of roaming around the glass up here. With regards to your living situation, four-point scale, how many of you would say it's, and, and hold on, I'll get all your votes in a second. Here's your, your pieces. Is it A, perfect? Perfect. You did it. You did it. He's ready over there already. Good. I, that, this side is ready to go. Okay. We got, okay. Now, hold your arms down just for a minute. The next one I want you to consider is it's not perfect. But you know what? It's good enough. I'm not doing anything for the next two, three, four, five years. Maybe I'll significantly remodel. Maybe I'll move. But not right now. Third one says, funny you should ask because I'm fed up. If I wasn't here eating the pizza, I'd probably be on the phone with a realtor. Uh, something's happened in the last 24 to 48 hours that's got you on the move. And the fourth one says, you are on the move. I don't want any whiners here. I mean, there's a, if you own a home, there's a for sale sign in the front yard. You have Zillow on your app and your computer screen. You are in the market, okay? Let's see where you land. I already got one. So let's go back to the first one. Now with show of hands, how many of you would say you got it perfect? One, two, three. Well, this is well, doing well in here. That's just scratching. That doesn't count. Okay. All right. I do, uh, by the way, not that I'm selling my services, but about nine years ago, I got licensed as a live auctioneer. I only do charities, but it's driving me crazy when I do seminars and because every time somebody goes like that, I keep wanting, you know, keep wanting to take their bid. Okay, so no scratching of your ear, sir. Please, you're in the front row. You've got to be careful. Okay, so perfect. We've got about five, five people in the perfect family. All right, I'm going to hold that second one for a moment. I'll go to the third area. How many of you are what we would call fed up? One, two, three. Got it. Anybody looking right now? Isn't that interesting, yeah. And if I was a realtor in this area, anybody looking right now? Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Let's hold that one because I'm going to show you one of the biggest mistakes we make when we try and persuade is we jump at the problem way too fast. We, we sh it's like playing poker. You're laying half your cards on the, on the table. I'll show you where that happens. But you can see it right in here. I'm not a realtor. I'm just polling you. So I'll get some honest answers. The moment I say I sell mattresses, how many of you think you got the perfect mattress 95% of the hands are going to go up in the air. I mean, I, I, do I want to buy a mattress today? No. Uh, perfect. See? That's, that's your, now you don't have to worry about me anymore. So hold on to that. But, but how about that last area? We got five over there and three over there and about 35 sitting in that. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. That is a key area. Um, I'll show you statistically, and we've been polling for 16 years now. I'll show you statistically where people sit, but you got a head start. There's a lot of people in that, I don't really like the way I'm doing it, and I don't know if I want to make a change. Actually, there's a, it's like a line in the sand. We nicknamed it the fix, don't fix line. It's the first decision point somebody goes through. They'll hunker around, they'll sit there, and they'll whine to you. We just don't do things as, as capable as we were. People aren't buying in. Well, let me show you a great solution we could do. So not, not, I just <clears throat> prefer to whine a little bit more if I could, and they'll just sort of keep whining. Sometimes showing the solution isn't the best answer. You know what? I think, and let's, uh, let's get our hand out ready to go. So I'll take a couple of volunteers who want to just come up and go ahead and let's, let's get handouts into this room. But I'm going to give you one sentence what we'll do for an hour. One sentence. The definition of selling, it isn't even up there. Best definition I've ever heard, because I, I wrote it, yeah. but, but that's not important. Uh, but how about this in one sentence? And we'll get to the ethics part in a moment. To me, selling is this. It's the art of taking an idea, 
planting that idea in somebody else's brain and making them feel like they thought of it. Now, what if we could, in our hour today, build a repeatable, predictable process to do just that? That's what we're going to do. Okay? But that's, that's the big picture look of what I want to do. To do it, I'll show you the decision cycle. We'll, we'll, we'll monkey around with that a little bit. We'll come out of the decision cycle. We'll talk about trust. We'll talk about urgency. We'll even put a measurement out there. And as I said, we'll do a, um, we'll do a little contest in here and see how ma mentally agile we are. But do you see the disconnect yet? Because we've already got it up on the screen in a sense. You might want to look at where people tend to be in their decision-making process. And now, if you'd like, I'll flip back and we can talk about how you define selling. Because in fact, the guy that I was giving a hard time, he's the only one that's right in here. You nailed it. Because obviously, I'm not here to waste your time and tell you, you know, we got new research. Listening, not a good thing. We shouldn't listen to people anymore. Uh, no, we still listen to people. We, we, we'll do, we'll still, uh, let me go back. I'll show you your def those definitions real fast. Uh, we'll still do what we say we're going to do, but I think that's an ethics definition. We're going to listen to people and take people's needs, but in a moment I'll show you there's about 7% of the population walking around with needs asking you to take them and show them what to do about it. Okay? That's called order taking. That's the low-hanging fruit. And you'll, and you'll taste just enough of that fruit to think I'm a pretty good salesperson. No, no. Uh, see that one there, the one that you bid on? I want to spend time talking about persuading people to address existing issues that they're not addressing. And I'm going to give you a hint. Tell them how great Agile is or tell them all the solutions is not the way we persuade. And then the last one, which actually was one of the most successful, you really love that one, is just the same definition as number two. I just threw a bunch of sales words in there. But it's really the same definition. So it's not that I'm telling you that please don't listen to people anymore. I'm telling you I want to figure out how to persuade people, okay, that are kind of stuck in that. I know it's not right. I, and you could be better, your agile thing of yours. But what if you make it worse around here? You know what? We'll stick with not so hot. But let me give you four more reasons why Agile's good. No, no, okay, yeah, please. You can keep, you, you, you're just chatting up to no one. All right? So we'll figure that one out. And actually, there's, you know, the, the taking an idea, playing in somebody else's brain. Somebody one time said, you know, your definition is in a movie. And, uh, and a matter of fact, it is. If you've ever, I'll just go by the buying slide real fast. If you've ever seen the movie, uh, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, okay, uh, there's a wonderful scene in there where you see, in a sense, the real definition of selling. So let's, uh, we got our sound ready, and uh, take a look at this real fast clip, you'll see what I'm talking about. We must let Costa think this was his idea. Jesus. 
it's a man thing. Okay. All right. So we've got our definition set. Now let's climb into the booklet. All right. Let's start with the decision cycle. So I'm actually going to give you permission right now to daydream a little bit. This is the only time. Then no more daydreaming from you all. But what I want you to do is daydream a little bit. We've got a couple people that are start looking for positions. Good. See where you are in this decision cycle. If you've you're working for somebody right now. Where are you in this decision cycle? What brought you to the company you're in? Uh, it, it can certainly be the clients you're working with, uh, people that are, that are looking at some of your potential solutions. But you can start thinking about just things that you grapple with. Back in the late 80s, when we started messing with this, we used to call it a buying cycle. Then we realized, nah, I, I've, I've trained uh, I've done probably 15, 20 seminars for NASA engineers. We talk about, we're talking with uh, over 1,100 hostage negotiators. We're well past the selling part. We're talking about the way people make decisions, just like you. And in fact, six stages. So while you're, while you're locking in, watch the six as they go by. See, the first stage is what we call the satisfied stage. It just means <laughs> I'm 100% happy with the way I'm doing things. I, I'm not looking to make any changes. I am thrilled with what's going on. From a salesperson's perspective, I'm not real happy with you, but okay. <laughs> Took us till the late 80s to actually admit, darn it, that there, there is a stage called the satisfied stage. Again, I'll, I'll break out all the numbers for you, but we'll cheat a little and tell you it's about 4.5% that are there. And, and although I don't have numbers that support it, I am firmly of the belief half of those people do have problems, they honestly don't know it. You could hook them up to a lie detector, they're going to pass. They're not lying to you. Now, if you're thinking, gee, you don't know the agile environment or you don't know the clients we work with, uh, yeah, I actually do. I'm not asking you how many people aren't being truthful with you. I'm saying in their gut, totally satisfied. That's not the wedge we really need to worry about. That's the wedge we need to worry about. That's the big one. That's called the acknowledge stage. No one's going to hand it to you walking in. Say, how you doing? Yeah, I'm not happy with blank. Uh, you're going to have to create trust. That's why I want to talk about trust in here a little bit. But when, you ha when there's trust, people will tell you, look, I mean, I, I love asking clients that don't seem to be giving me a whole lot. I don't walk in with this, but at some point you may hear me say, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the ad typical adaptation of blank? And rarely do I hear a 10. If I do, and you're telling me the truth, I need to get my things together and, and find another client to get in front of. But a lot of times, even the ones that really seem very happy, it's an 8. I just want to hear what's keeping it from being a 10. And that's what I'm looking for. Remember, people don't typically, on their own, fix small problems. They fix big problems. We've all been bitten by that before. When we've driven that car, let this car never had a problem with it. Oh, good. So we will never have a problem. No, uh, it will. It's just a matter of how big it will be and when it will be. And will that move you over the line or will it be the next one? But, uh, I, you know, and I learned this as a, as a life insurance salesman. But at 22 years old, I learned this. Because in, in two and a half years, my phone only rang twice. For people looking for life insurance. First time I was really happy. The second time, at 23 years old, I was already, that's, I'm thrilled. Just, <clears throat> what did the doctor tell you today? Okay. Why are you calling a life insurance salesperson? That's a product that actually needs to be sold. It does. It does amazing things, but it needs to be sold. It's not a life insurance class. But I, I grew to respect it after I left the industry. No, the acknowledge stage says, I'm not thrilled with what I'm doing, and I don't really want to, I'm not, I'm not committing to any change, but I'll whine about it. Hold that thought, okay? Big wedge. Then something typically happens. Um, you know, maybe if it's a car, you drop a transmission, get a nice $4,000 bill, all of a sudden you're not so in love with that car. Uh, if it's a business, all of a sudden a deadline's missed, a project is not done properly, there's repercussions of some sort. All of a sudden, people want to hear what it is you're, you're monkeying around with there. Uh, what, what is that thing? Uh, you know, they, maybe they're beginning to look to ad adapt it a little bit faster. But when they come across that line, they hit what we call the criteria stage. And the criteria stage is interesting. That's the one where people have needs. Here's what I want. Here's what we're looking for. The perfect program in here would offer us this. 
See, it's very solution-based, not necessarily your product yet. It's, it's the dream of the product. For those of you that are looking for jobs, for instance, uh, it's, I don't really know exactly what we're going to call this job, but I know I'd like it to do these three or four things. That's the criteria. Those are the needs. Here's the weird part. Most salespeople, are, salespeople have this all wrong, too. They, they buy into something called needs-based selling. Ask the, just like you did in a sense. Ask the client what they need. Take those needs. Provide solutions to those needs. Good. If I told you 80% of the people don't want to fix it but have a problem they're living with and 7% are walking around with needs, what party do you want to go to? And oh, by the way, that 7%, uh, there's nine different salespeople in the picture there. And they all got their fingers crossed hoping that that need will look like their product. Over here, we can begin to craft the product because the problem shapes the need. Needs don't come from heaven. If you bought a house in the last 10 years, now you know, I'm, wherever it is, your number one need was, we got to have a house that I can almost guarantee it's addressing whatever the biggest problem was on this side. I wanted a nice big house. How small was the other one? I wanted it quiet. Oh, how close to the highway were you living? See, the problem shapes the need. Very important psychologically. So I don't really want to walk in and go, don't know you from a hole in the wall, but what do you need? You could do that online. You really don't need a, a problem solver or a consultant for that one. So there's the criteria. Those are the needs. Then what they do with those needs is they begin to walk around and they investigate. If it's a car, and I, the 13 years, I was a little slow on this last car purchase, but just purchased a car a week ago. Uh, that's when, here's what I'm, here are my criteria, now I'm going to start looking and go, because we know what's going to happen in most of the dealerships. Going to be a little rough in there. So we don't typically go, go in there when we're just sort of thinking about it. We have crossed that fix, don't fix line, and we're going in. Okay? All right. So what we're doing is investigating. We're taking that criteria and investigating. From there, we pull the trigger. I don't really have much to say about that. That's you going ahead and saying, I'll take it. But from there, we always go through a buyer's remorse. We, we, and it's got a trademark on it, but so I, or you'd see it on my model. But the reconsider is we have to, we have to understand, even if it's for our own decision, that those butterflies that you feel, that I'm feeling it right now. I'm you know, driving this car. So I see another car that I almost bought go by and go, did I make the right choice? Is this the thing for me? Does this say Rob Jollis? Uh, that's just me in that reconsider stage, but it's natural and it's normal. And then it's just gonna, gonna slide into that satisfied stage, hang there as long as I can, and then that car won't be perfect, but it's gonna be really good, and then we'll see how long that one lasts. That's the way people make decisions. Uh, I, I, I don't wanna do it in here, but I've had groups that, where we talk about even relationships. The problem shapes the need. <laughs> I'm just telling you, if the last person that you spoke to went out with, chewed with their mouth open, the first date with the next person, you went to a sandwich shop and said, just take a bite out of that for me. <laughs> all right, all right, we go, we're going somewhere. If they were too loud, you wanted somebody quiet. Too quiet, you wanted them louder. Problem shapes the need. Once we learn that, changes to what the conversations we're going to have. I'm no, no, nowhere near, here's my solution, let me give you five reasons why it's great, who knows, maybe one of them you'll actually like, so stay there. That, that's just not persuasion. Well, one other thing, we, we call it influence you know, without manipulation, persuasion without manipulation. What's the difference between influence and manipulation? And then I'll give you a hint, it's real close. It's real close. Actually, I think it could be summed up in one word. I don't want to disappoint you. Bang. Intent. In other words, there aren't two parallel universes where there's a process for influence and then a process for persuasion. Sadly, the process doesn't really change. It's the intent. Meaning, if I've got an idea and I know that you fear change, we all do. And I know that I'm going to have to probably give you a bit of a push. But this, in, in the end, is going to be great for you. Not me, you. Then I'm going to use tactics, ethical tactics, but I don't consider that manipulation. When I was at the car dealership that will go nameless, 
as I was leaving and said, I'm coming back Monday to buy it. We're getting Mother's Day, uh, Father's Day food. It was a Saturday. Uh, I'm with my wife. We, we, uh, uh, the persuasive tactic used, which really annoys me, was the sales contest. We have a sales contest. And if we can move this many cars, okay, but you see, who does that benefit, that sales contest? You or the dealership? So you want me to buy the car to help you out. That's funny. I thought I was buying the car to help me out. And that's unfortunately why they're not all bad. Car dealerships, they're trying. Let's give them a little bit. But they're kind of stuck in the 70s a little bit there. Excuse me. They, they're a little slow to adapt. We're still going to towers and things to get price negotiated. And eh, I wish they'd stop, but they're working on it. They're working on it. Uh, I'd like to think, without being a homer, uh, yeah, because Toyota's been a client of mine for many years, I think they're trying harder than the others. But it's really hard. Uh, it's not the company that it, that's fighting it. It's the dealerships that fight it. Anyway, let's not stay there too long. So let's talk about the three decision points. In that cycle, three things are going to go on. One, and the big one, that's that fix, don't fix line. Okay. Uh, do I want to change or not? I, I, we could be there for years. Once we cross that line, uh, it wasn't the water pump that did it, it was the transmission. So now we're up to about $5,000 on repairs just this last year, okay? Okay, now I want to fix it. Now what am I going to fix it with? Okay, once I do that one, come across that line, it's not that I, we make a decision in the morning. If, if you look at it from a job search angle, it's you whining about the job and whining about the job and whining about the job, something probably happening, and you're going, you know what? I'm working on my resume. I'm going to call some people. I'm going to see, where, isn't there a recruiter in the family? Uh, you see the difference between this side and this side. Okay, so that's that second decision point, which is, okay, I want to fix this. Now, what am I going to fix it with? And then the third one that comes up after that one is, all right, I want it fixed. I got to figure out what to fix it with, and now I want to figure out where I'm getting this from. Okay, three three decision points. This one, if we remember no other chart. Trick question. It's the only chart I put in here. But remember this one. Take a look at that. I, you know, maybe it's me, and and I get excited about my own numbers, but that's staggering to me. That's basically saying with your children, with your significant others, with your employers, et cetera, most everyone is sitting on that. We know it's not perfect, but it hasn't cost us our biggest client yet. OK, I'll come back in a few months. We'll wait for them to lose a big one, then I guess we'll change. And that's why I really think it's, it's I wrote a piece one time, was that actually, it's actually in this, this book. I'm not hawking the book. Get it out of the library. Uh, but don't do that. But, but, <laughs> but for every author, there's typically something that will trigger a book. And for me, it was a conversation with somebody that I had worked with as a, a coach. I had been on retainer with a company. And this woman made a huge sale. And she sent me a little email. And she said, I did everything you said. But, and, I, and I'm really glad I, I got it. She said, but I felt like I was mean. And I knew just what was coming, that, what she was talking about. She asked questions that were not comfortable for the client to answer. And I wrote a piece that triggered a book, that, that'll do it, uh, called It's Not Mean, It's Merciful. In the end, you know, one other quick story, actually, which, and I think it'll cement this home. If, any, any writers in here, anybody's published? Book? Yeah, OK. So you know, most publishers won't change the inside a whole lot. They're usually working on the cover, and they're trying to get the outside, because that's what sort of the copy editor will clean up our grammar. But most people aren't changing. This publisher loved the whole book except the first story. They said, we want that out. It's too disturbing. I said, I took it out. But the first story was this. It said, you're sitting on a bar stool with a friend who likes to drink a lot. And as usual, this friend's had a little too much to drink. And you know, you're a little concerned, so you ask for the car keys. And a friend says, nah, I'll be fine. And you say, no, no, I need those car keys. You're not fine. He says, I'll be fine. And, uh, but today, you can't get the car keys. And friend, as usual, heads out. 
but this isn't an as usual day. Uh, person's not fine. Person takes the lives of two people on the road on the way home and mm -hmm. injures themselves. Now, we understand that what's going to happen next is uh, that person who commits that horrible act uh, will have to live with that horror for the rest of their lives. I'm not a judge or a jury. I can't imagine what that would be like. Maybe there'll be some prison time. They'll probably be financially ruined. Who knows, maybe they deserve it, not for me to say. Of course, the family, the survivors, the survivors to that family, they'll never be the same either. But what about you? What about you? You had an opportunity to get those car keys, and you didn't do it. You'll live with that, too. If I could show you a way to get the car keys, would that be of value, and would we call that manipulation or influence? See, that's what I mean in terms of I'm not going to stand here and sugarcoat this and tell you that persuasion's always pretty. I'm here to tell you that the things that often we're persuading companies to do save companies, save jobs. Uh, and so it may not be the prettiest conversation. We've got to figure out how to have the conversation so the target's not on our back. Don't blame me. But it's not mean to me. It's merciful. Yep, there's a lot of people in there, so let's talk tactics. We've got about 30 minutes to go. Okay? One. Now, this, was, this won't be a hard one, but I will tell you we blew it in 88 because we figured trust was so easy. Let's get at the good stuff. Well, I can't get at those difficult questions. I got to earn the right to get a certain level of conversation. And if you don't trust me, we're not getting there. So we have to put some sort of process together for trust. I think this will be fairly easy, but let's at least process it. So we talk about trust. Let's break it down into four pieces, four A's, because publishers like when we do four of these and make things rhyme, et cetera. It's probably in your book as well. Process always has to be rhyming or something. I, Makes me nervous. Four A's of trust go like this. One, uh, I like early on to ask open questions. I'll bet three quarters of the room has learned what an open question is. So, anyone but you, because you're the only star in this room right now. Who else wants to tell me what an open question is? Yeah? One that doesn't have a brief yes or no answer. Perfect. One that can't be answered yes or no. Is that where you were going? Good. Great. Now, understand this. Even with the sales training, uh, I, uh, I still have. I still, I'm old school, I still bring out these old micro uh, tape recorders. Uh, but when I work in workshops, I don't tell people, ask questions, listen, what's an open probe? I just say, well, let's start, go sell something for me and just bring the tape back. First of all, I almost never hear any questions anyhow. And the ones I hear are almost always closed. An open question, when they can't be answered yes or no, gets people talking, gets them to open up. I, it's not an interrogation, it's a conversation. So I'm not looking to see who asked the most questions. I'm looking to see who's got the client talking or the other person the most. I hope you believe this simple statement. The more the client or the other person talks, the more they believe you, the more they trust you. So it's instinct versus logic. What I just said is very logical, I believe. Don't for a minute think it's instinctive, particularly the open-ended questions. What, how, why, tell, describe. All sorts of words there. If you're from the West Coast, share. All those words will work. One, ask open questions. Two, actively listen. We've done some studies on this. I'll take a shortcut and tell you this. We, we polled audiences to try and figure out what they don't like about the way we try and listen. And we, we got a list of the top ten. I, I'll just tell you that the other nine didn't equal number one. What do you think the most annoying listening habit as told to us by your clients? by your customers, by the other person. What annoys them the most? Well, hang on there, you. You're a star in here. I want that guy. That guy. Now, what do you think? Take a shot. What do you think the most annoying listening habit is? Fooling around with your phone, not bad. Okay, that's called an assist. Uh, actually, I made the top 10. Interrupting me when I'm talking, number one, by far. And remember, when we're on a process and I've got a lot of questions and I'm ready to go and I'm really going to use this thing that Charles told me, okay, we, sometimes it's a casualty listening gets knocked down a little bit. Frequently, we're just working on our next question. No, 
Actively listen, use open questions, aim your probes. I'm not gonna go into detail on that one, but it's more of, my questions aren't, do you think the caps will repeat? Uh, you know, how do you think, the, you know, what, do you think we've had enough rain so far this year? That's not my question. My question is, if I'm selling a laptop bag, I want to know how you're currently carrying around your uh, laptop and other materials. I want to know what you typically put in that bag with you. I want to know how valuable it is. Because I'm starting to think about what type of product here. That means aiming, playing my strengths. I sold for Xerox. Uh, look, we cost more and did less. But we did a few things real well when I sold for them. And one of them was we were easy to use. Why would I not ask every single client I ever met walking in, who uses the equipment? Does that intimidate you, that question? Because boy, is there a right or wrong answer for us. We're hoping the answer is everybody. <clears throat> Good. But if you tell us, just that guy over there, he used to work for Xerox, he was a tech rep. <sighs> Not so good. However, good anyway, because I was going to spend 15 minutes trying to push you into a solution that was never going to work. My, my idea does other things too. Either way, I'm going to win. Aim your probes. And then the fourth one is avoid problems. And we talked about that 20 minutes ago when I said, if I say I'm a realtor, who's got a problem with their house? No one's putting their hand up. Hmm. You go in there and say, how you doing? Yes, I want to talk about Agile. Who's got a problem with adopting Agile? Or People are going to back up a little bit. Feels like a trick question to them, and, and they don't want to get in, you know, ensnared in this conversation. One, two, three, four, you do that. Come off the problem. Begin with, as Covey said, begin with the end in mind. That's what I want them to want. Listen, ask open. Good job, all right? But here's the, here's the tough part. This, if, you, if you remember nothing else from me, focus on this wedge, and I've got it documented for you. <clears throat> Call it the art of urgency. So far, all we've done really is spend a little bit more time with open questions, trying to create trust, but I told you, now I've got to ask tougher questions. So, how about a sequence? One. Uh, well, it's in there, but one. I'm going to use identifying probes. Questions that, uh, that, that deal, now I'm ready for the word, for, for problem related words, okay? I want to know about some of the concerns that you're currently experiencing here. What sort of difficulties do you have when you're trying to, to uh, problem solve in this particular area? What type of challenges, <clears throat> obstacles, limitations, barriers? The, the, actually, the only word I won't use is the word problem. Uh, it's not an opinion, it's a fact. We've studied that one. People don't like that word, they just don't like it. Do you have a problem with that? See what I mean? Just sounds aggressive. So uh, first of all, I wouldn't want to be closed anyhow there, but you mentioned that you've been doing it this way. What sort of challenges does that create when you, try, when you add this to the picture? Okay. Now I've earned the right for that. I still don't see any genius yet. All right, yeah, occasionally we've got, uh, we'll do things and we'll have to repeat what we're doing because we haven't carefully mm -hmm processed it out the way we should have. But we, we kind of know how to do it. I understand. But you know what, what the knee-jerk reaction is when you hear, yeah, that doesn't work for us sometimes. Well, with us, you won't have to worry about that anymore. Because if it's really, and here we go. We're going to now solve it for them. You know what? Let's stop solving problems for people so fast. If, the client, if that person you're trying to persuade were that smart, they would have fixed it already. I'm not fixing it for you today. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going deeper, and this is the one that requires mental agility. It looks very benign, but a developing probe is a second, third, fourth level question. What happens when that occurs? How often does it occur? Who's covering for that person while that, this is going on? What effect is that having on the clients who are working with you? What's the, what, you see what I mean? Those are second and third level questions. I might even finish it with what we call an impact probe, which is to get them look at the whole picture. So overall, what do you think the ramifications are of doing it this way instead of that way? But you're going to paint the picture. I'm not painting it for you. That's called a probing sequence. That's important. There's two rules to a probing sequence. Rule number one, always let the client paint the picture. Rule number two, you don't ever call a client's baby ugly. Meaning, I got it, you do it this way. I don't want to go, look what's happening to you. 
<laughs> now, now it's again, it's the way I'm saying it, not what I'm saying. I want to be very, very respectful. Uh, I don't, I don't want to drive on that car lot and have somebody laugh at the car that I'm driving. I didn't drive on the car lot because I'm writing some thesis paper on cars. Obviously, there's interest. Don't laugh at my car. Don't so. Be respectful of the process or the way people are doing it. They wouldn't be having this meeting with you, this conversation typically, if there wasn't a spark of interest. At the end of the day, all I want to do is persuade. So I don't want to lose you here. That's why, I, you know, if I happen to love this clip, but if you've ever seen a classic example to me is the infamous Tommy Boy. Okay? And if you look at Tommy Boy, he's selling brake pads here. Okay? I think he's doing the right thing. I just think he's doing it the wrong way. Take a look. I'll show you what I mean. All right. Now, it's sales time. So remember, we don't take no... Uh, we don't take no prisoners. We don't take no for an answer. Oh, yeah. We don't take no for an answer. We don't take no for an answer. We don't take no for an answer. No. Okie dokie. No. Okay. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Terrific! Thanks for your time. Let me say, hey. Well then, I'd just like to add that the spectrometer readout on the nickel cadmium alloy mix indicates a good red strobe and fade, increasing incidence of wear and depression. Whoa, little town, uh, you're not speaking my language. Oh. What my associate is trying to say is that uh, our new brake pads are really cool. You're not even going to believe it. Like, um, let's say you're driving along the road with your family, and you're driving along, and all of a sudden there's a truck tire in the middle of the road, and you hit the brake. <laughs> Whoa, that was close. <laughs> now let's see what happens when you're driving with the other guy's brake pad. <laughs> you're driving along, you're driving along, and all of a sudden the kids are yelling, thank you. I don't know what's going to happen, Danny. I don't know, Danny. <laughs> Cut that to your validate part, but uh, and you know it's funny. I, I showed that clip. I, I I loved that piece so much that I adopted it before we even could get video into PowerPoint. I used to play the audio of it. That's how much I liked it. So always been a big Chris Farley fan. Uh, my son is a stand-up comic in L.A. Uh, we've all, I've always appreciated a good comedian, uh, and it breaks my heart to see that sometimes because what are we talking about? Did anybody not know that Chris Farley was going down a, a horrific path? And it seems that he couldn't be saved. And maybe he couldn't be. But sometimes, you know, I kind of want to whistle and go, well, bring a salesperson down the post. Let, let's see what we do. Because like I said, I, I want to take my, I want to make it that person's idea. Uh, I want to look at, I want to look deeper into that problem that maybe the individual is looking at. And maybe people were doing that. It just breaks my heart that uh, we lost them and we lose a, a bunch of them. And it's just a shame. So like I said, you ask questions that are difficult for people to answer. If I didn't think you need me, I wouldn't ask them. But I want the car keys, basically. I want the car keys. Anyway, have you ever heard of the old saying, what somebody hears, they forget. What they see, they remember. What they do, they learn. I want to do it a little bit. And, and so I want to do an exercise in here. As I mentioned, we're going to, we, we, we'll see what happens. I, I have gifts. I have brought gifts. So what we're going to do is it's an exercise that's called word for word. And in word for word, well, I'm going to bring up hopefully 10 people or, or close to it. We'll get them, get them right up here. We're going to, uh, what I did was to tell you where I sort of started working with this. 
Having been in the industry for many years, I kept telling people what to do, and then I would come back, and they struggled doing it. And I said, all right, what's really holding us back here is our speed of thought. You can't write out a developing probe. I don't know what my second level question is until I hear you answer the first one. So I really have to think quickly on my feet. So I actually went to Second City in Chicago. <coughs> if you've been to New York, the Pit, uh, uh, pit, the pit uh, Improv House, UCB, LAN New York, uh, and just started studying the way they train improv actors and thought, you know what, we could use a little of that. So there's an exercise, this is an example of one. There was an exercise they used. It's called word for word. And what we're going to do is we'll bring 10 of you up here uh, and we'll just let you, I'm going to kind of keep a little uh, beat going. And 10 of you are going to start and one of you is going to, we'll end up winning this thing. But it's just going to be a speed of thought exercise. So I'll go over the directions in a moment. I want to see who's got the guts. Come up here and join me. Bang, come on up, 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 come on up. Let's see what we got here. I got 10, line them up right here. I like this, excellent. Yeah, yeah, I'll take you, yeah, yeah, come on up. I'm looking for 10-ish, okay? Two, come on up, sir. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. The pot is right. Okay? All right. So now I'll tell you the rest of the rules. <laughs> Notice I forgot to tell you all the rules. I, I wasn't thinking, I guess. No, it's, uh, I'm not going to spring anything unusual on you. Here's the exercise. We're going to start over here with you. All I want is a word. Any word except somebody's name. It can be a city, a state, don't care. Okay? But what we're going to hear is, might, maybe you'll say the word jacket, okay? I'm going to want you to take a pause, then repeat the word jacket, and then give me another word with the last letter of the word you just heard. So it, don't worry, you're not repeating nine words when we get down here. You're just going to focus here, okay? So it might sound like this. It might be jacket, there'll be a pause. It'll be jacket, toy, there'll be a pause. It'll be toy, yard. There'll be a pause. There'll be yard dog. There'll be a pause. There'll be dog good. There'll be a pause. There'll be good. And, and we keep going, okay? So, uh, that said, the only other rule is, let's see, nobody's name, and let's not repeat words. So the only thing you got to listen for on this half, and then we're going to sp sprint back over here, is if we, if we use the word yard, give me yo-yo, give me yellow, give me something else, but yeah. let's not repeat words. That's it. So you're going to have to listen to what's going on. You don't have to memorize it. And you're going to focus. Now, I'm going to cheat and tell you something else that's going on here. We'll just see if they can abide by it. I love the exercise because there's a pause in there. I wrote a whole article one time. I really believe in the, what would I call the power of the pause, something, particularly when you're trying to persuade and you're talking about something difficult. Why are we rushing the next question out? Don't we feel like we're being listened to when somebody actually takes a moment and processes it and then says something else. But sometimes you'll we'll hear somebody say, what do you think is the most important part here? Someone will say, well, this, and then what do you think? And it just feels very artificial. So use the, use the pause. Use the pause. Okay. So each time I'm going to, I'll go slow the first round. And what, let's just take one more step forward because what's going to happen is when you're eliminated, any of you will be, okay? We're just going to push you back one and close the ranks. Push you back and close the ranks. It's brutal, but it works. Okay. So, you ready? And, Robert, you're in good shape. You're the only guy with a free pass. Once we get off the number two, because for some reason number two always seems to struggle and we're all learning through it, then no more free passes, okay? All right, so, we'll give it about this rhythm, and I'm ready for a word. Diamond. And we'll pause. And you see, that's why we say it's always the second guy. You're going to repeat the word diamond, and then you're going to give me the next word. You're going to do it just like, no, no, you guys, you don't get that at all. Okay, all right, so we're going to stay with the same word. Like I said, it happens every time. All right, ready? Give it to me again. Diamond. Diamond. Do. Wait. Now. Oreo. Do Oreo. I'm not giving you any freebies. Oreo, enough. Enough. Hope. Hope, egg. Egg, good. Good, dog. <laughs> dog, 
actually, I just had right now. Close the ranks, everyone. All right, so we're, what is it, good? Dog, dog. Don't worry, there'll be plenty of company soon. Okay. <laughs> dog, ready? Dog, gather. Gather. Gather, wrath. Back he goes. Okay. <laughs> wrath was a, Well, it took a little too long. I got to push it back. I, I don't don't I, I didn't, couldn't remember if you said no proper names, but. Well, Rathbone, I'm not is that a name? Basil Rathbone was Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, so that was sort of a name also. So, okay, so it's, what was it, Red, what? Gather. Gather, Gather. okay, ready? Gather, Ruby. What was that? Ruby. Ruby. Ruby, yes. Yes, sandwich. Wait, <laughs> yes, sandwich, I'll take sandwich. Sandwich, help. Uh, uh, <laughs> All right, sandwich. I'm really sorting on it, but. Sandwich, house. House, eggplant. Eggplant, toy. Toy, Yankee. Yankee. Yankee, echo. Echo, Oreo. Been used? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> echo. Uh, echo, Oprah. No, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, echo. Oprah. Echo. <laughs> Orbit. Hmm? Uh, Orbit. Trumbull. <laughs> <laughs> Orbit. Tree. Tree. Ass. <laughs> Tree. Elephant. Elephant. Time. Time. Eclipse. Eclipse. End. Oh. In. Day. Day. Yellow. Yellow. Whiskey. Whiskey? Wind. Huh? Wind. Wind. Like W I N D. Whiskey. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the wind part was good. <laughs> okay. All right, whiskey, ready? Whiskey. To you. Whiskey, yam. Yam, mango. Mango, orange. Orange, and. Oh, and, and you gave us that too. There's your champion right there. All right, now hang on, hang on. I gotta tell you what you win. Where's my clicker? Where's my clicker? Where's my clicker? All, all the hands on for the clicker. All right, let me show you because we're gonna do this sort of like a game show. Here's what you win for not exactly winning. Okay. All right. That's right. Every single one of you is gonna win your very own Rob Jollis lightning bolt. Been wearing it since I was 23. Stands for energy and enthusiasm. You get nothing else out of me today. Understand, you don't show up with energy and enthusiasm. No process is going to bail you out. Take a lightning bolt. Remember the time you came up here? Didn't exactly win, but had the guts to try. Congratulations. You're all getting a bolt. It's coming down. Okay. Now, yeah. But what do you win? Well, I'll tell you what you win. Well, yes, you're going to get that, but you're going to win your very own Rob Jollis Fun Pack. Here it comes. First of all, we're going to start your Fun Pack out with your own Coffees for Closers coaster. That's right, a picture of Rob right on there. High stone quality, but wait, that's not all. You're also going to get your very own, where is it? No order taking keychain. Now, I'll tell you why you're going to like that, because you're going to let people see it, and when they go, what's that all about? It's not about being stubborn, it's that you didn't invite in an order taker. I'm gonna ask you questions no one's ever asked you, and this helps me remember to do it. But wait, we finish it off with, of course, your very own Rob Jolly's How to Change Minds book right there. I'm gonna put your name in there, sign it all up, and give you a good job. Congre congratulations, give her a hand, she did great. As did all of you. Well done, head on back. Good, we got, everybody get a bolt? Okay, I'll make sure she gets one, all right. That's right. I watched a little bit of Let's Make a Deal as a kid. I, uh, uh, what can I tell you? I got your bolt here too, by the way. I got your bolt, I'll put it with the book, okay? Good, and that's right here. Just don't let me forget, sitting right here. Okay, all right. What's interesting about that exercise, the re reason why I wanted to run it was, first of all, it's enjoyable. But second, in a sense, it does simulate what's going on. Instead of a question instead of a word it's a question so you're hearing it you're asking a question you're getting a response you have to listen to the response I can tell you of the nine people that got taken out at some point 
probably seven of them got taken out because their mind, they were thinking about not what was coming right here. They weren't trusting their instincts. They were trying to get an E word in their head or they were trying to get something going. You have to just sit, that, sit back, listen to what's being said, pause, trust yourself, and you'll be able to come up with not another word but another sentence. So listening was very powerful up here. You can't preload them. Uh, but uh, anyway, lots of very interesting stuff. And as I said, the pause is very important to me. OK, so let's wrap up a little bit. And then I'll take questions until you don't have any more questions. But I always like, I, I always like some sort of measurement that says, how do we know whether we've got the person over this line? And by the way, Jalice, you said take an idea and plant it in somebody else's brain. When are we going to do that? Well, we already did it. If I'm asking you about questions, that I, about problems that I fix well, and we know that the problem shapes the need. If I keep asking you, what do you do when you can't write? What do you do when you can't see? Uh, are you looking for something that's going to allow the group to see? Yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I'm driving towards a solution. I talk about problems that I can fix well. Okay. So when you're asking about, an, uh, you're, you're not just asking about any issues, Whatever, maybe, what's, what's one of the greatest strengths of Agile? This is an Agile group. What do you, if, brag a little bit, yeah. Able to change directions based on needs. Okay, change directions based on needs. See, I'm not offering it that way. What I'm asking is, what sort of challenges do you have when you have to change directions? Oh, well, you know, it feels like we have to retool, and sometimes we're too late at getting at it. <clears throat> Tell me more. <laughs> well, such and such. Then what did you do? Uh -huh. Who else did that affect? Uh -huh. When we come over here and, and say, are you looking for something that's going to help you change directions a little bit more proactively, that's just what we need. Okay? That, I'd like to say everyone who stops you and says, I'll tell you what I need. I need to be able Sometimes we have to help them, but I am planting the seed here and growing the crop over here. Okay? But I want to make sure that we've changed minds. So when it's time, and don't get annoyed by the term, but I have a trial close. No, but let's just call, I'll just take a temperature read. Better, better, better words here. One, I'm always going to ask somebody, are there any other concerns that we haven't addressed? Okay? Any other issues that we didn't get at? You know why? Have you ever met with somebody that was rather closed with you and said, this is it, we'll talk to you about that, that's it? And somehow, halfway through the conversation, all sorts of issues started coming up. First of all, pat yourself on the back, because what's, what's going on is, as probably an unconscious competent, meaning rather naturally, you're moving somebody over that line, and when they come over, they'll start whining about a whole lot of things. They're holding those cards because they don't want to show all those cards. But I don't like to leave it up to chance, so why wouldn't I, at the end of those sequences, at least ask somebody, gee, are there any other issues that we haven't addressed? If there are, I want to make sure I get them down, and if not, Good, don't bring, me up, bring them up one later on in the conversation. But here's what I think is the best trial that we never use. See, you're used to the car lot a little bit. You're used to what we call a pre-commit. It's nasty. Pre-commit is, if I could show you a way to work more proactively and be able to, you know, would you, in fact, adapt to this process? Uh, actually, on paper, and I'll write about it a little bit, it's not ter as bad as you think. And I'm overacting a little bit to make it worse, but certainly not here. You know what I want to know? Do you think it's worthwhile looking at some other ideas? Do, is now a good time to look at some solutions? Uh, are you committed to making a change? I won't ask all three. I'll just pick one. But it's yes or no. And I'm going to get one of two answers. No, I don't think it's worthwhile looking at any solutions. Well, let's look anyway. See, you got a go, no go right there. It doesn't mean I'm gathering my things and leaving, but now we're creeping into what we call an objection. And I want to clarify and find out why. That's OK. But I think if I shake your hand and say, hi, let me tell you all about Agile, and hopefully I'll do a good job. And then I go, so are you committed to making a change now? You can you see the disconnect? If I say, let, let me just hear how you're currently uh, working within your space. OK, and now let's work in some of the, that, that challenge you mentioned. But let's go deeper, and let's measure that a little bit. And let's make sure there aren't any other issues. And 
Do you, now do you think it's worthwhile looking at some other ideas? Uh, I don't think you're going to get as many no's here. And now when we come over here, we've, because we've been working on a problem we address well, it's going to turn into a need that we address well. So that's an important piece to me. See, what you fail to remember, or maybe you do, is that I know your solution is passionate to you and it's obvious to you, but it's not obvious to other people. And I think one of the, again, I told you my son is a stand-up. He knows this guy. About, I don't know, it might have been five years ago, this video went viral. We in the sales community, particularly me, saw it and wanted to shake this guy's hand. Uh, Maybe you remember it, maybe you don't. It's called, it's not about the nail. And what it's going to help you remember is the solutions are always, the problem is very obvious to you. The solution is obvious to you. To the client, not so obvious sometimes. Watch this clip and we'll wrap up. <clears throat> Brilliant. Okay, so I promised you an hour. We went about an hour and four, not bad. Uh, although I'm gonna, we'll do a Q&A for as long as you'd like. If some of you have to go, you go. Um, I will tell you that I write something every two weeks. It's absolutely free, but if you go to my website and just sign up, it's what, it's what I call a blarticle. I'm, I'm not a big blogger. I feel like a blogger says, I had a tuna sandwich and boy was it good. So I actually legally registered blarticle as yeah, I'll tell you a story, but if there's nothing in it for you, it's not a blarticle. So I always try and capture an idea or a point, and I, uh, part of the legal definition of blarticle is 700 words or less. So I keep it short. I'll try and have something in there, and uh, that's it. I don't, it, you'll hear from me every Friday, other Friday morning with a little bit of a head start on what it's about. So if it doesn't look like it's your week, leave it. I'll try again, do better in two more weeks. But uh, love to have you join up. And that's it. Uh, I would be happy to take any questions that you have, uh, but I want to thank you. you. You hung in there very nicely, and I really enjoyed talking to you. my meetup group. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. You know, I, I do, but going back to Chris Farley, I, I don't know if you ever saw the very first motivational speaker sketch that he did, but it's a wonderful moment where they, they say, He's been in the basement drinking coffee for the last three hours. He's used to bigger crowds, so keep pretending you're bigger. I actually had that in my head going, I'm going to pretend this group is a little bit bigger, and I'm going to enjoy the heck out of you. So, uh, but anyway, you, you did great. What can I answer? Whatever you'd like. Yes, over there. So, Rob, you have another meetup group that you've gone to a whole bunch of times. I don't know if this group's appropriate to pitch CNM. Oh, CNM. Okay. Yeah, is that actually a meetup group? Would we call CNM a meetup group? It is. Okay. So, CNM is a group that I've been volunteering with for six years now. And CNM is, uh, stands for Career Network Ministry. Now, it's a non-denominational group, yeah. which I'm going <laughs> to, I happen to be <laughs> Jewish, okay, but they let me in there. Um, and what we do is uh, that we bring in speakers, and uh, I got brought in and, um, about mm -hmm. six years ago, yeah, it was, 
And I thought I was going to walk into a room of 20 people or so, and there were about 200 people in that room. And it's people in career transition, and it's everything is free. We have resume development. We have LinkedIn, people that are specialized in LinkedIn. We have elevator pitch tables. We have uh, a, a Toastmasters group, two of them. Uh, and it's really a wonderful thing. It's Tuesday nights. It's at uh, McLean Bible Church. And as I said, now we will pray when we begin and pray when we finish. Uh, but it is non-denominational. It's really there just to help people who are in transition or considering transition. And it's a group that I'm passionate about. And as a matter of fact, it's a, the newest book that I've finished that, that won't be out until October 2nd is based on my six years there because it's a... Um, what happens sometimes when you're in transition is you start losing confidence and you start losing faith in yourself. And um, so the book is actually called Why People Don't Believe You. And it deals with building credibility from what I call the inside out, which means there's some wonderful tactics to help people believe you. But first, you have to believe you. And that, it, that can be chronic and that can be difficult. And so. Uh, but it's, um, I'm excited about it, and, uh, but it came from that group, and it's a wonderful group. And uh, if, you, if you can send me an email, and uh, like I said, I'm there all, when I'm in town, I'm there. And uh, I'd be happy to kind of walk you through and maybe even volunteer. We get some people come in, and they'll, they're good with resumes, so we'll put you at the resume table or, or something. But um, it's, a, it's a wonderful group, and thank you for bringing it up. Appreciate that. Yes? A lot of you know it's a probably general, I mean, you know, it's supposed to work with everybody, but individualistic personality and cultural, how they will really affect you. I mean, you can affect someone In persuasion? Them. Back to this topic yeah. here? Or, okay. Uh, but, you know, one of the things, and I was, a, I was a slow adopter, I don't really go cultural as much, although because I go around the world, I have to adapt to the culture that I'm going to. It's usually more of me slowing down and Avoiding slang is how I talk to the culture, because persuasion doesn't really change all that much, I find. But um, where I was a slow adapter is if we could, let's put culture here and deal more with personality. That was my slow move. I mean, um, uh, many of you probably have heard of Inscape or DISC uh, or Myers-Briggs, some of these personality models. And I really kind of didn't like it very much because they call themselves sales models and they're not sales models. And then I realized, uh-oh, we need them. Because I'm laying out questions, for instance. How about, I'll ask Rob a question. How long do we schmooze for? Well, one, that might be cultural, OK? If you know what the word schmooze means, OK? How long do we chit chat for before we go at an idea? Uh, the answer isn't 4.3 minutes. Uh, if I'm dealing with a dominant individual, we're going to not do a whole lot of schmoozing at all. Uh, if I'm dealing with a social person, we're going to do a lot of schmoozing. So now what am I going to do, flip a coin? So it's not that I can send out an assessment and say, fill this out. I'm going to come visit you in a week. So, I, so what I have to do is I have to look at your emails. I have to listen to if you've left me a voice message. I have to, uh, I, I, if I get into your office, um, we, we won't be able to do it here, but if you walk around offices, you can tell personality by not even with, the, with the person not even there. If I see pictures of Camp Winnipookie and the kid's on a trailer somewhere, I go, social. If I see it kind of scrubbed down, dominant. If I see piles everywhere, analytical, uh, we can begin to even tell by the way someone's dressed. It's an educated guess. It's not perfect. But what that helps me do is pace the conversation. As for culture, uh, I don't, I, every time I think I'm going to make an ad a change, and I mean, I, I was in Malaysia fairly recently. No, they really, uh, every time I say, well, we do it, so do we. <laughs> they, they, it's, it was me more looking for the personality than the culture. I can always learn more on that, but I don't specialize in culture. I just specialize in trying to adapt the personality. And I realize we kind of need them. Last thing, and I'll leave it be. I, sometimes I, I love the movie. I'm a movie guy. I love the movie My Cousin Vinny. I bet most of you have seen that at some point in your life. And what a yes. <laughs> I got you beat. If it, it's one of those things where when I'm surfing and I hit my cousin Vinny, it's like, uh-oh. Yeah. You know, well, I'll come back when we, once we get to trial. Uh, but what's really cool about that movie is watching the personality of the judge, Fred Gwynn, right? And Vinny. 
and one of them is trying to sell the other one. The judge does not need to sell the lawyer. And you see as that movie develops, Joe Pesci begin to dress properly, begin to put his ideas together, realizing the only way to be successful is to adapt to Fred Gwynn's rules and follow that. Uh, he didn't get it at first, <coughs> spent a number of nights in jail learning it, but I love that movie because even that two Utes part, you know, the two what, what was that word? That exchange is perfect. You're watching two personalities just sail right by each other, okay? When they lined up, he was successful. That's what we have to do. Yeah? Uh, so could you talk a little bit more about how do you get people to move from the um, satisfied to acknowledged stage? Ooh, it's a really good question. So, and I don't get that very often. Satisfied to acknowledge. I th you know, it, it's interesting. Let me play that out my own way a little bit. Sometimes when somebody's satisfied and they're telling the truth, what they're often saying is, we haven't had a problem with that. We're not telling you we won't, but we haven't had it yet, okay? And that, my favorite word, the three words, what happens if? I love that piece. Now, I don't walk in, shake a hand, and go, how you doing? What happens if? But if I'm looking, tell me about how you do that. Well, we do it this way, and we haven't had any issues yet. Okay, and what about this? Doing that fine, okay? Uh, it's, it's like an example I sometimes I use is a motorcycle. I, I only had a motorcycle for a very short period of time, but I had an uncle once who told me there's only two types of motorcycle riders. Them that's been down and them that's going down. Must, must have ridden a few times. Okay, which really takes the joy out. I stopped riding so I wouldn't be Right, well, well, he stopped riding. That, you see, in a sense, that's what it is. So if I say, what concerns do you have about falling off your bike, you and I would both say, none. I'm really careful and I've never fallen. What happens if you do? <laughs> well, that would be it. You know, and now, and then how long, so how long would you be out of work for? What type of insurance would be covering that? How do you think that's going to affect the other bills that you're that are stacking up? So answer to the question is that what happens if we can get us into a scenario that actually doesn't exist uh, yet? And it's, it's a way of getting into a problem that isn't a problem yet. I'm not trying to inflate a problem. I'm just saying, at some point, just like insurance, you're 23, you'll live forever, so of course you don't need life insurance. But you're going to need it at some point. And I used to sell a policy. I, it's very obscure. Had what was called a PPO, a policy purchase option. It, all it did was say, here, buy this as cheaply as we can get it. And every three years, you can double it without any evidence of insurability, which means all I'm going to do is insure your ability to buy it when you actually need it. It wasn't a bad policy, actually. Uh, I had other issues, but in my own crude way, I was trying to protect somebody who didn't have a problem but might down the road. Uh, and it, I sold a lot of them. <laughs> but um, that's how I do it. I'll, I'll, I'll create a scenario, or at least talk about one, that deals with that fall that's never occurred. Uh, and that helps. Yeah? Sorry to ask you the exact same question, but I don't know off the answer, but if the person's clearly seeing a risk that isn't very likely to happen, very interested in asteroid insurance, but doesn't want collision insurance. Doesn't, uh, interested in asteroid insurance. Asteroid insurance, insurance but doesn't want collision insurance. <coughs> No, stop the camera. No, I, 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 I'm not sure what you want me to say about that. No, I'm just asking yeah. for like tips. Like, how do you move that person that is not seeing the? Yeah, well, it's all in that sequence, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dedicate this poem to you. I'm gonna give you a poem, and I'm gonna, <laughs> and I think I can answer you in a poem. <laughs> okay, called "For Want of a Nail," written by Ben Franklin. Uh, they say, although we've fact-checked it, it may have been around before Franklin. Old. And the poem goes like this. See if it doesn't shed a little light. It says, for one of a nail, a shoe was lost. For one of a shoe, a, a horse was lost. For one of a horse, a rider was lost. And for one of a rider, a message was lost. For one of a message, a battle was lost. And for one of a battle, a war was lost. All for one of a nail. What that helps me remember is People don't look down the road at their problems. If they did, if we did, we'd all make different decisions. So our job 
is to actually sequence our questions to get people to look down the road. So I, yeah. So I'm not saying, what concerns do you have about the nail winning this war? I don't know, horses are hopping about. If the nail doesn't go on the hoof, what's the rider doing? If the rider doesn't have the message, how are the troops making decisions? Now you got me. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. I'm actually sequencing so it's a logical connection to, you know what? We could lose the war. Rehoof these horses, or whatever we do. <laughs> and that's how we do it. Little chips at a time. We don't go big question. We, that's those developing problems. That's why even up here, I got to just listen, pause, and give you another question. Listen, pause, a little further, just bump it. Got it. OK. What else? Yeah. Uh, you just hinted at it there, but um, since people make decisions on emotion and then back it up with reason, um, how does that play into the process of moving someone over from the acknowledged to the criteria stage? Emotion? In a sense, through our sequences, we are creating our own emotion. It, and that's why, um, you know, even in what I'm working on now, which, which is exciting for me, and that's this new book, I'm not hawking books, it's not out, is it's the way we say it, not what we say. The, the, the title I wanted was, it's not the words, it's the tune. So to answer your question, particularly in this emotion, we have to be really careful of our tune. So I can't say, David, for one of a nail, when you don't do that, what impact is it having here? Boy, first of all, why am I smiling? You know, what, what, what happened to empathy? Yeah. Or even when we were talking about career network ministry, one of the things that concerns me about an elevator pitch always has is you got the words, are you learning the tune? Uh, so, or does it sound like an elevator pitch? And we know what it's, an elevator pitch sounds like a lot of us. I empower co companies by spontaneously, whatever, you know, okay, that's uh, clearly an elevator pitch. What do you really do? I, you know, so it's, it's not just learning the words, it's learning how to say the words. Learning pitch, pace, pause as I call them. Uh, learning how, almost like an actor, to get into character to feel what we're about to ask somebody, because we're getting ready to ask a guy to give up his motorcycle, okay? And he hasn't even fallen yet. And I don't, remember when I, I looked over here and I said, I don't want the target to be on my back when we do this. So I have to be, I have to really ask these questions as if I don't really know the answers. Um, and I have to be in the moment when I ask him. I'm not sure if I'm getting at 100% of your question, but it's, I want to put those two together to make it authentic. That's the key. We got to get authentic. I mentor a lot of authors. You know what every publisher is looking for? Not your grammar. You're hung up on your grammar. They got copy editors that clean up grammar. They want that authentic voice of yours, Robert. And if they can hear it when they read it, they'll be interested in that book. So it's, and when we persuade, we have to be authentic. So this was a really good process laid out here. Don't, I'm proud of it. But now I'm learning that the trilogy to me is, part of it is, now let's say it like we mean it. And the only way I know how to do it is to actually be in character. Feel for that person on the other side of the table. If it was you, how would you do it? How would you feel? Get there, and you don't have to worry about concocting an emotion. The emotion's there. And have you ever done any acting before? Yeah, okay. Method acting, right? How do you cry on stage? Go cry, cry, come on, cry. You know, it doesn't work that way. We take ourselves to another moment that's very emotional. We don't have to work real hard at it. It's there. Uh, okay. Yeah. First, what do you require patience? Like, what if you have urgency? Uh, maybe it's a different class. Maybe you need to talk about patience, but again. Oh, yeah. Okay. The whole urgency piece is I create urgency by digging deeper into the problem. That's how I do it. I, my patience is just to stay at the problem and stop solving it for people. Uh, you know the problem, the solution, you know, you know the problem, we, you know the solution that you have to get Yeah, there, right? yeah. But you have to get them fast. Right. You don't have time. I'm going faster Tomorrow by... Tomorrow I understand. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I'll go faster by asking you four more questions about the problem than I will giving you 15 reasons why I've got to get out of the way of the tornado. Okay? So I actually will make you quicker, not slower, but you have to 
pay your dues by allowing somebody to discover that problem without you preaching it to them. Or with Chris Farley lighting up a car and going, I can't feel my legs. Okay? I mean, we are. Questions? Fantastic. Here comes my come stuff. Okay. All right, let's hear it for Rob. Yeah. Three books tonight. Okay. Um, so, Rob, if you want to Boy, there's, there's a ton there's, of tickets here. There's going to be uh, okay. a few slicks. All right. Lucky this winners. Is, this is one right here. Okay. David, what's that? Aledio? Oh. Ale is it me? Might be. Yep. Uh, David, David. <laughs> David, right? Yes. I'm learning that name. And he was one of the first guys in here. Looking at this book, and I said, you got to win it. Let me write your name in there for you. Okay? Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this one's yours. We're going one more. Feels almost crooked. First guy in. How did that happen? <laughs> okay, you can see that there's no hanky-panky. Or is there? No, there's no hanky-panky. Hang on. That was a joke no one got. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. I was going to say this one doesn't have a name. Uh, John Camp Campus? Bang. You're the man. Let me write your name in there, okay, John? I'm, I'm going to sign it for you. I'm going to get your name in there, okay? One more, right? Uh, actually, that one's been won. Right over there by the queen of mental agility. She's awesome. All right, so we got that taken care of. I'll fix these up. Yeah, and I think Rob will probably stick around. We, we, you know, by 8.30 or so, we definitely need to kind of filter out of here, but feel free to stick around. Uh, I'd love to keep asking uh, questions. And as long as, as, long as Rob's willing to entertain it, I'm sure uh, he'll be happy to answer whatever you have for questions. Uh, don't forget, I have to put the basket to put any kind of uh, uh, feedback for us out the glass door here. You'll see it off to the left. So if you got a moment, please just drop one of these cards in there. If you got a two moments, then just write a little note on there. Love, love the feedback. Uh, if you want to take some uh, food home for yourself or kids or dogs, cats, whatever, we got some left over, so feel free to grab that. And again, let's hear it one more time for Rob. Thank you for coming out. And I owe him his, his chocolate and Amazon gift card for coming out here tonight. How about that? I, I'm a wealthy man now. All right. Thank you. All right. So I got your book ready to go. Although I don't have your lightning bolt. So if you, you want your lightning bolt, I got to get you. Yeah, yeah. You don't like that lightning bolt. Come on up. Let me give it to you real fast. Great chocolate. Oh, my God.